Can it be moved down? I don't need to move down. I just need to close it. Yeah. That's actually it. Should be able to. Can we just close the top? Just close it and then open it up again. How are you? Uh, just a quick question. So I'm going to use my laptop to read something, and I just want to set it on top of this. So can I just close it? I won't do anything other than yeah, close it. I'll just push it back because it, it might slide off. Like right like that. Yeah, just like click on the bottom. Great. Right. Okay. There you go. Fantastic. That's perfect. Not first. It's not first. Not to you. It's not to you. I'm close it right here. You reach out. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I can probably step back a little from that. Um, my name is Megan Harrington. Uh, welcome to our session. I work for Americans for the Arts, and I'm going to be the session staff monitor. So I just have a few quick announcements before we begin. Uh, this session is called Supporting Vulnerable Immigrant Artists and Communities. The three stated learning outcomes for this session are as follows. <clears throat> Hear about projects designed to sustain immigrant artists and the communities from which they emerge. Consider language barriers, geopolitical concerns, ways of working, and legal considerations that may serve as barriers to immigrant artists and how to overcome them. And explore mentorship and mutual collaboration as a way of engaging genuinely and deeply in immigrant communities, as well as challenging power dynamics that may inadvertently crop up and which must be addressed. Also, just a reminder of a few of Americans for the Arts policies related to accessibility, which is part of our ongoing work to pursue cultural equity. First, we at Americans for the Arts believe that amplification benefits everyone and that no one should need to request that someone uses a microphone in order to understand effectively. So as such, we have instituted a policy that anyone who is saying something intended to be heard by the entire room must use a microphone. So during our Q&A portion of our panel today, we have this mic here in the middle of the room. So if you have something that you would like to say or if you have a question, we ask that you line up behind the mic and be at the mic before you begin speaking. And in that same vein, we ask that you refrain from side conversations as they are disruptive to your fellow attendees and can keep them from fully hearing the session's content. So thank you so much for attending our annual convention, and I am now going to turn it over to our panel. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you so much for being here this early in the morning on a Sunday at the end of the conference. It really means a lot to me, and I think my uh, co-panelist because I believe that this particular topic is extraordinarily important, uh, critical to our country, and something that is not talked about enough. And so I feel very fortunate to have you here uh, to listen and respond and have a dialogue with us uh, about immigrant artists and their vulnerability. And it, it heartens me that you are in attendance this morning. So thank you very much for being here. Um, I'm Michael Royce. I'm the Executive Director of the New York Foundation for the Arts, and we're an organization that provides international and national programs for individual artists in all disciplines. We do this through several ways. We do it through granting mechanisms, we do it through professional development, and we do it through online resources. Um, today I will be serving as the moderator for our distinguished panel. Um, these two wonderful women have contributed significantly to the discourse and actions on behalf of immigrant artists, and I will allow each of them to introduce themselves and what they do in the context of today's forum. Uh, we will have time for questions after the presentations, and we look forward to 
not answering them, but again, engaging in a conversation with you about them, because you may say something that will help all three of us, and we would love to know that. Um, before I turn it over to the panel, I want to frame the discussion uh, for just a few minutes by giving you a few statistics, which some of you may know and some of you may not know. The Americans for Immigrant Justice, a nonprofit law firm, cites on its landing page a few economic indicators that all Americans should continually remind themselves as the rhetoric on certain media channels continues to grow louder for the deportation of undocumented immigrants. There are three things that they say that I think are important to this conversation. One is that upwards of two-thirds of undocumented immigrants pay into the Social Security system without any expectation of ever collecting benefits. It's estimated that their contributions on a yearly basis are 15 billion. A July 2015 report by the American Immigrant Council concluded that undocumented immigrants commit violent crimes at a far lower rate than native-born Americans. And a September 2016 report published by the National Academics, I'm sorry, National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine found little to no negative effect on overall wages and employment of native-born workers in the longer term from the influx of immigrants. The report called Immigration Integral to the Nation's Economic Growth because immigrants bring new ideas and add to an American labor force that would be shrinking without them, helping ensure a continued growth into the future. So I think those statistics are really important for us to think about and perhaps even to memorize when we hear uh, how immigrants are allegedly destroying the opportunities of what we call Native Americans or third or fourth generation Americans or people who have been here forever, uh, however we want to define ourselves, I think we need to remember that uh, the statistics don't support that they're taking anything away from us. And in fact, they're only helping us to grow. Um, and then from a political perspective, there are some things I want to note. Uh, Stephen Miller, and some of you may know him, he's uh, President Trump's senior policy advisor. He recently stated to the public and media on the enforced separation of children from their parents who have been apprehended entering the country. He said this, in quote, no nation can have the policy that whole classes of people are immune from immigration law or enforcement. It was a simple decision by the administration to have a zero tolerance policy for illegal entry period, end of quote. And then in response to that, uh, Senator Jeff Merkley from Oregon said what I think many of us in this room think ourselves, and he said, quote, this is not a zero tolerance policy. This is a zero humanity policy, end of quote. Um, <clears throat> according to a September 2017 Washington Post article, immigrant apprehensions were up by 43% compared with the same time in 2016, with the sharpest increase among those with no criminal record. And a May 2017 NBC News report stated that arrest of non-criminal undocumented immigrants increased by 150% between February and May 2017 compared with the same time a year prior. In 2017, the administration deported nearly 215,000 immigrants. So clearly immigrant communities are being placed in desperate situations, but there are things we can activate upon to push back, and we're gonna be talking about it this morning. And to reiterate what was said earlier, we will be hearing about projects designed to sustain immigrant artists in their communities, tackling barriers specific to immigrant artists, and engaging immigrant artist communities through mentorships, collaborations, and challenging power dynamics. And with that, I'm gonna take a seat and turn it over to our panel. Hello. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Michelle Angela Ortiz. I am a visual artist and community arts educator. Um, I have been working in communities for uh, now going on to 19 years uh, and working in all different settings, um, but really focusing uh, uh, my work in public space and creating large-scale murals and public art installations centered around the stories of communities and reflecting the realities that they're dealing with 
and also challenging them to really also come up with solutions to the issues that they're dealing with. Um, I feel that um, utilizing public space is a way to create a platform to really talk about um, these issues that need to come to light, to create awareness, to create education, um, and to also spark uh, action, sorry. Spark, uh, move people in the direction of, of action. Um, so I'll be starting my presentation sitting from here. Okay, there we go. <laughs> I was trying to figure out what I was gonna do. Uh, all right, um, here we go. Oh, perfect, thank you. Um, so in uh, 2012, uh, I created um, my Familias Separadas project, um, which stands for Broken Families, Separated Families. Um, this public art project centers around how families, uh, specifically undocumented families, have been affected by deportations and the detention system that falls within the mass incarceration system within our country. Clicker, am I doing it right? There we go. It's not going this way. Guys, can you help me out? <laughs> Is it okay if I just go to the podium? Might that be easier? Okay. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? Awesome, thank you so much. So um, in 2015, I created um, five different installations within the city of Philadelphia uh, around five stories of five families that have been affected um, directly uh, with the issue of deportation. Um, these installations, this installation, this is one out of five installations that were created in the city of Philadelphia. This was installed in front of the Immigration Customs Enforcement Building on 16th and Callow Hill which used to be the former immigration center. Um, I remember going as a child to get our passport tickets, our passports in this building. This building now detains, it's the first point of deportation where they detain um, individuals within the state of Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Delaware. Um, and this is the first process of where loved ones are detained and then moved out into jails and prisons to continue with the, their de deportation proceedings. What you see here are the words of Ana, who is an uh, undocumented mother originally from Guatemala, uh, who was detained at the Burke's Detention Center. So this is how I first learned about the Burke's Detention Center, which I'll speak about in a moment. Um, and uh, her words uh, were placed in front of the doorway in front of the ICE building, in front of the doorway where loved ones are leaving. And as we installed that evening the video clip that you just saw, um, ICE agents were looking down at us as we were installing these words. These words were up for a full month um, in the city of Philadelphia. Um, and it's really about challenging, um, instead of saying uh, shut down ICE and um, we can, you know, si se puede, uh, and these, those phrases are extremely important, but it's also about how do we continue to um, utilize space so that we can really uh, amplify uh, the existing voice of the community. It's not about giving voice, it's about really amplifying the existing voice of the community and community members. Um, this was a 90-foot long stencil that community members actually participated in the creation of it and the install, installation. So it was a really powerful moment to see families who uh, saw this building as a symbol of fear and become fearless uh, in the midst of installing this piece. Families were there, my own family was there. Um, so it was a really uh, amazing moment. From, from this work, um, I've now have moved on to the second phase of Familias Separadas, which is uh, currently being supported through my Rauschenberg, Robert Rauschenberg Foundation grant um, as my, I'm an artist as activist fellow. Uh, this work is now really focused on the Burke's Detention Center. Um, the Burke's Detention Center is actually one out of uh, three family prisons 
So those two words do go together, family prisons, you heard right. There are children as young as nine weeks old that are detained, that have been detained here in this prison. Um, and it resides in the state of Pennsylvania, about an hour and a half away from Philadelphia. This is a county-run center, which means that the Berks County, which resides right outside of Reading, um, earns $1.3 million in the detention of families. During the time in March 2017, I started um, doing sessions and working with mothers that were inside the prison. These were 14 mothers who, during their time there, um, had organized labor strikes, hunger strikes, and fighting for their freedom. The mothers were detained for close to 600 days, that's close to two years, with their children. As young as, as I mentioned, there were children that learned how to walk in the hallways of this prison, um, and teenagers, and even older, older uh, children who uh, were also um, suicidal. There were other accounts of rape that happened within the center, a long laundry list of human rights abuses. In 2015, the center um, actually had their center, their license revoked, and they still continued operating against federal and state law. This center, this is one of the children uh, of one of the mothers that I worked with, um, which you will hear her voice in a second in one of the installations. Um, he was released at his, on his, shortly after his fifth birthday. He was detained for close to 600 days, two years. And uh, I've been connecting with the mother since they've been released from the prison. And he still trembles when he see, sees a police officer or hears a siren. So the intention of the work that I've been doing, um, and I'll show some examples in a second, is um, really about focusing uh, on the stories of these mothers that doesn't, um, is not going to be placed in a court case by their lawyers or in a campaign letter uh, through uh, the coalition um, that I've been working with, which is the Shutdown Berks Coalition. But this is an opportunity through the artwork for the mothers to actually finally tell their story. Um, as I was in the center, I wasn't allowed to bring any video cameras, um, no audio. Uh, I was very limited to what I could bring within the six month time frame that I was visiting the mothers. Um, so these images that you're seeing now are now because they are released. So as I mentioned, 14 mothers were detained for close to two years and fighting. Um, they are victims of the system, but I also want to communicate that these women are incredibly resilient and I see them more as warriors than victims. And so the, the 14 mothers, 10 of them were deported back to Central America after being detained for those two years, back to the conditions that they were fleeing with their children in the first place. And four out of those 14 mothers are now in different parts of the United States. They have been freed from the center, but they continue to have to deal with ICE. Um, most of them still have probation bracelets, they have to report to ICE every Friday, um, and they also have to report to ICE offices every month. And every time that they have that contact with ICE, that fear of deportation is still very constant and present in their life, as well as the trauma that they faced before, during, and after detention. So in the fall of um, 2017, September through November, I participated in a citywide project called Monument Lab in Philadelphia. And this was one out of the uh, 22 other artists who um, exhibited. Uh, this piece was shown in between or sandwiched in between Mel Chin's monument and Hank Willis Thomas's monument. And this was projected onto the uh, doors of City Hall in Philadelphia. Uh, what, you're, what I'm going to play right now is the translated version of the animation projection of the mother's, uh, of what the voice that you're going to hear is the mother's, uh, one of the mothers that was recently released, days after her release. And during the actual uh, projection, um, you actually hear her voice resonate throughout the, throughout the city and City Hall, so you can actually hear her voice as the animation plays. So I'm gonna play just a little snippet. If you could turn off the caption, please. 
um, and you'll be able to read the uh, words. Caminé con mi hijo por 25 días. El Salvador, Honduras, Guatemala, México. Caminamos por espinas, tierras blancas y montes. Crucé el río crecido, oscuro y de color café. Cayó agua fría del cielo, gris, mientras que mi hijo me decía, mami, no me sueltes. Agarré mi mochila y a mi hijo, por miedo que les arrastraba las aguas fuertes, y seguí caminando. Nos agarran, nos gritan, nos humían, nos tratan como animales, y nos encierran. Mojada y con frío, abrazo a mi hijo sobre mi corazón, donde guardo todo y le pido perdón. So if we could turn the caption back on, please. Um, what I'm going to play and I'm going to speak over this is uh, the actual projection that you uh, just saw. The animated projection um, was mapped out on the gates of City Hall in Philadelphia. This played throughout the uh, two months of the exhibition, and as you can see, the gates unravel and begin to tell the story of the mothers. Um, and you hear, as I mentioned, uh, as you're walking by, you're able to hear the voice of one of the mothers tell the story. The story was written by two mothers, and we went through the process of actually editing the stories throughout my visits. Um, all of the imagery that you see here was based on paintings and drawings that we were able to do um, within the center with our limited materials. Uh, I was the first artist to actually come into the center with any art supplies. And also, this was very different for the mothers who were so used to writing campaign letters, uh, and as I mentioned, uh, uh, writing for their cases, um, for them to actually talk about their stories before detention, during detention, and their hopes and dreams after, since they were still detained during this time. Um, so the imagery that you see is all inspired by a list of images and writings that we all agreed, the mothers and I, uh, together. And as I mentioned, the story that's being told by the mother uh, was edited along with the two mothers uh, that were detained inside. Um, I share all of this because in terms of process, um, I have the power and the privilege to come into the center and leave, right? Th this privilege that obviously the mothers, uh, ha it's, it's a human right of freedom that the mothers and their children have been denied. So for me, it was very important to involve the mothers in every step of the way to have them go through the process of looking through the story that they, that they wanted to be told, how the story was going to be told. And then once the, one of the mothers was released, immediately afterwards, I was able to um, be, be able to um, record her voice, something that I was not able to do inside the center. While I was at the center, as I mentioned, I was uh, limited with material, so I wanted the mothers, um, because again, these are women who uh, are living their, th this, this issue directly. And so um, I didn't want to have them go through the process of telling their story and being re-traumatized by retelling their story. So during my time there, I, I wanted the women to be able, the mothers to be able to create something that would give them hope to create something that was tangible and real. Um, and so since I couldn't at that time have them outside of the center, I brought these flowers, these paper flowers, and this is a tradition that I learned through my grandmother that um, was also very familiar with uh, the, the, the two mothers, and we began to create these paper flowers that were reflections of their messages of freedom and their hopes and dreams of freedom for their children. The mothers in total did close to 20 flowers, 
paper flowers. Um, and then what I, what I did was I opened, um, I opened a workshop space at the Barnes Foundation where I invited individuals to come and work on these paper flowers to learn about family detention, to begin to write messages of freedom, um, and also to provide them with the information of how they can then take action uh, as constituents in the state of Pennsylvania. So what I was able to do was create 1,600 paper flowers that were hand dyed and assembled with one of the words that the mother said, libertad. Libertad was um, the word that they felt that was the most important to express. And all of these flowers were then assembled into multi panels and installed in front of those very same gates where the projection was placed. And uh, shortly after the Shutdown Berks Coalition, which is my community partner of organizers, activists, lawyers, who have been fighting for three years to shut down the center, um, utilized this moment to then have a press conference to talk about um, the, the issues at Berks and to put pressure uh, to our governor, Tom Wolf, who has the power to shut down the center. He has the power to do an emergency release order to shut down the center. And that's what we're trying to do at the moment. Um, this is another snapshot of, of the piece uh, at City Hall, which has been um, displayed here and um, here at City Hall, then uh, at um, the Barnes Foundation, and recently at the Kennedy Center uh, in Washington, DC. Uh, and this is the image that, uh, of one of the mothers, as I mentioned, walking with her son um, who was freed. And um, the work that I'm doing right now um, is currently working with, uh, I have interviewed three out of the four mothers that are now dispersed along the United States. Um, as I mentioned before, this is now an opportunity through video and through audio that I can capture their stories and they have the power to say and share what they want to, um, how they want to tell their story. Um, and the other thing during each one of my visits, because I can't physically bring them outside of each state that they're in, um, is that each mom and child are creating small illustrations that will be part of a small book of their hopes and dreams for their children. Um, and I feel that that's incredibly important because, again, as I mentioned, we know that they're victims of the system, but it's incredibly important to leave uh, actually moments of healing through the creative process so that they can focus on where their struggle lies, and, and it really lies for the love of their children. Uh, what's going to come out out of these next, uh, um, this next phase, and I'm going to end with this, is that um, there will be public art installations uh, throughout the end of September and October, right before election time, throughout the state of Pennsylvania. Um, and uh, all of these public art installations will be focused on messages and images from the interviews that I've collected with the mothers. Uh, there's that small book that I mentioned with the illustrations that will be dispersed in different schools and community centers throughout Pennsylvania based solely on the mother's stories and what they want to communicate. Uh, we're also collecting stories from families who are currently still detained at the Berks Detention Center, which are 30 families, mostly fathers. Today's Father's Day. So honoring those fathers who have crossed those borders with their children and are still fighting for freedom. Um, and uh, those 30 families will be trying to connect with them uh, to also participate in the fanzine and to also share their story. So as long as they, they can't physically be out of the center, we can uh, give them the tools for them to actually share their messages outside of the center. And finally, there's going to be a short documentary uh, that shows obviously the process of the installations, but most importantly, the voices of the mothers telling their stories um, and what they've lived throughout their time at the Berks Detention Center. So I'm gonna leave you with these words of one of the mothers that you see here, and this is what she wrote that was in the uh, projection. She says, I pray at night and I see through my window and I would like to touch the stars. I would like to become one of them to shine in the dark and walk along with my son towards freedom. Thank you.
You're welcome. Good morning, everyone. How are you doing? It's really early still. <laughs> well, that's reassuring, some laughs. <laughs> My name is Zeba Rahman, and I uh, run a program called the Building Bridges Program at the Doris Duke Foundation for Islamic Art. Um, the Doris Duke Foundation for Islamic Art is uh, part of the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation. Uh, we're a national funder, and the mission of the Building Bridges Program is to advance relationships and increase understanding between American Muslims and the broader non-Muslim community. Uh, we do this work in the belief that it, when communities are vibrant and resilient um, and cooperate together, it is mutually beneficial and it's uh, far better for our well-being. So with that, I'm going to get started um, and, and tell you that I come to this work after 20 years in the field as a, a curator and a producer of the performing arts, working both nationally and internationally. Um, and I, uh, in particular, am interested in marrying um, both the um, arts and the discursive, the intellectual, the thinking uh, intellectual, um, the studying of um, part of our brains, and have uh, worked or built platforms that do both, that, that toggle between both, that bridge both. And um, so I bring that uh, lens to the work that we do at the foundation and the Building Bridges program, which I feel is very apt given my, my experience. Um, and uh, even in this position as a funder, um, the approach that I take and, and also my team takes is one of uh, being an advocate for the work. Um, we, we feel very much that we're part of the, the community that we're serving and the need that we're serving and that we're learning right alongside. So um, our approach is um, that we're part of a learning commons, if you will, and, um, and these exchanges with our grantees, with our consultants, with our colleagues in the field um, at every occasion where we're in uh, public spaces such as this, we learn, we continue to learn, and we take back that learning and, and try to inform our program uh, accordingly. Uh, and uh, the other thing is that, that uh, I belong to the Muslim community, the American Muslim community, and uh, also serve the American Muslim community. Uh, we now uh, refer to ourselves as the Massa community, which is Muslim, Arab, and South Asian. Uh, somebody is advocating for adding a T to it to include Turkey <laughs> and other regions. Um, so like other communities, we continue to change our um, acronym. It gets a little complicated sometimes to remember all the letters, uh, but right now we're the Massa community. Um, and as you know, um, given um, geopolitics and the, the current environment in our country, we are still struggling with a lot of strife. Um, the terrain that we work in, in is highly complex and fast moving. Um, and again, you know, we're, we're constantly learning um, as, as we move through each day. Um, so with this, I'm going to say that um, the complexity of working in Trumpistan um, is monumental and urgent. Uh, the challenges are huge. Our, um, when candidate Trump campaigned with weaponized language and bore down on the country's vulnerable communities to create fractures in our social fabric, he, he did so to elevate his vision, his strategic move. Um, at the Iowa National Security Action Summit in 2015, when an attendee asked him, what he believed was the most prominent lie that the American public is being propagandized in regards to national security. Trump's response included, a including a mention of immigration. He said, Muslims, and I quote, 
Muslims can come in, but other people can't. Christians can't come into this country, but Muslims can. Something has got to be coming down from the top. The Muslims aren't in danger, but the Christians are. With his presidency, anxiety and shock gripped our communities, continues to grip our communities, immigrants and refugees most especially. There's deep uncertainty about what social and fiscal policy is doing and whether there's even a place for any one of us in today's US. The central worries are about fundamental rights, freedom of expression and assembly, and whether we have a voice Words matter. And what we've seen is that there's a spontaneous, after the anxiety, there's a spontaneous eruption of feelings that continue to unfold nationwide. People in small communities to larger are pouring out their thoughts in public spaces, online, in private conversations. They're talking and they're writing, 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 as you can see here. In a, New York City public sub in a New York City subway station, the subway therapy project sprang up. Um, it's really a modern day thought mosaic, if you will. It, allows New Yorkers to, it allowed New Yorkers to express their feelings on post-it notes. Um, and the overarching message in every language, in many languages, is that love trumps hate. That confirms the fundamental human impulse. The New York Historical Society, recognizing the importance of this communication, and really is communication, is actively engaged in preserving these notes in its historical archives. So, what more can we do, and what more can we do to support the arts community and artists and the communities from which they emerge. The only thought that I, I can share is that we have to press on, we have to keep trying. And as uh, I take inspiration from Harry Belafonte, as an artist and civic activist, he says, artists are the keepers of truth. We are civilization's anchor. We're the compass for humanity's conscience. And what artists really do is help us feel, see, and hear issues more acutely so we understand the world around us, so we can reflect and navigate thoughtfully in such fraught times. Freedom of expression and creativity serve as a way to participate and stake our ground in current affairs. And as we saw from Michelle's very moving presentation, that is so. Thank you, Michelle. People crave the right to expression when they feel silenced. I mean, this is so evident in, in that post-it project. This is where our support of this work has a vital relevance. Artists understand the responsibility of being the moral compass. Their sensitive antennae provide a pulse on societal signals, which they then communicate with breakthrough creativity to provoke and inspire us to act. My program, the Building Bridges program, supports arts and media projects that advance cross-community bridging, elevating Massa, Muslim, Arab, and South Asian community voices, and amplifying their stories through engagement with the media. The media has such a large role to play in shaping our thoughts. As one example, our grantee Ping Chong Plus Company has a project, a recent theatrical work, called Beyond Sacred, Voices of Muslim Identity. And it's performed by young American Muslim New Yorkers who tell their stories of coming of age in a post 9-11 era. At an exceptionally vulnerable time for them, it's empowering them. The American Muslim community is empowered as well. And it also empowers everyone, it touches everyone who has ever felt like an outsider. We've seen this throughout the performances and the talkbacks and other uh, complementary activities that Ping Chong and Plus Company have undertaken. They're now expanding the project's footprint nationally to engage and drive public conversations in diverse communities and to find those common points of connection. 
Another grantee is the Proteus Fund Security and Rights Collaboratives. Um, with its partners, it created the Can You Hear Us Now? Muslim Spokespersons Training Project. Um, and it did so with tested messaging. The project served as a platform for those, who, for those trained to act and amplify their stories strategically. With the hashtag, Can You Hear Us Now? Those who had been trained created a bold and humorous tweet storm to clap back at Donald Trump's comments about Ghazala Khan that implied that as a Muslim woman, she was oppressed. So that's one of the two memes that the massive community has. One, that we're terrorists. Two, that our women are oppressed. And uh, Ghazala is the mother of fallen US ca um, Army Captain Humayun Khan. Trump stated that she was forced to stand in silence on stage next to her husband, Khizr Khan, at the DNC, at the Democratic National Convention in Philadelphia. After high profile uh, tweets that trended massively, um, this uh, initiative was nominated for a Shorty Award, and you can actually see um, the participants from, some of the participants from this um, um, program sitting there at the table. Uh, they gathered from all over the US to attend the Shorty Awards, um, and uh, it was nominated in the category of social good, advancing social good, along with NBC and several other uh, major media outlets. The Shorties are the most prominent social media awards program with online viewership in the millions. It recognizes the best content to communicate about key issues in the digital space. Its social good category honors those who create a positive impact to further societal well-being, including social justice initiatives. And then, here's another grantee I'm going to talk about, and recognizing the role that media plays in lifting up issues and shaping thinking about them, as well as the need um, for having well-researched, nuanced stories um, in our, our ecosystem, particularly about refugees, the Building Bridges Program awarded a grant to News Deeply, a new independent digital media, digital media syndicate to develop the Refugees Deeply platform. News Deeply came to our attention as a game changer in telling in-depth stories about topical issues. Launched in 2012, News Deeply was co-founded by Laura Satrakian, pictured here, who came to the, who covered the Middle East extensively for five years as an ABC and Bloomberg news reporter. A mission-driven media company, it delivers high-quality journalism on some of the most pressing issues of our time. News Deeply's philosophy is simple, to channel news and information into a single subject platform through a highly engaging mix of design, technology, and specialized reporting. Time Magazine has called it a model for the future of news, while Fast Company has said that it outsmarts the news and redefines conflict coverage. And beyond grant making, uh, our, um, our approach as a team is to um, serve as witness to other creative remedies that are emerging from our communities. Uh, here are images from an iftar in the streets event held in New York recently. And as you can see, we had powerful allies. During the recently concluded month of Ramadan, which is uh, the month of fasting and reflection for Muslims, um, the Arab American Association of New York, the New York Immigration Coalition, and Jews for Racial and Economic Justice partners to hold an iftar, which is the breaking of the fast at sundown. And they did it in, in front of the ICE offices in downtown Manhattan. And the feast, as it was, was supplied by the food truck Halal Guys, and it was quite a feast. Um, the bright spots are the fresh uh, new cross-community collaborations like this that are on the rise. Um, they pool strengths, including skill sets, particularly legal know-how, and it encourage us, encourages us to coalesce and act together. 
I'm reminded in talking to you about uh, this subject today uh, of what Dr. Martin Luther King said. We may have all come on different ships, but we're all in the same boat now. Even if strategies and tactics are distinct, we have a common mission. With this resolve now more than ever before, the creativity that we have can lead the way to help us row our boats together in this fluid, rousing moment for mutual well-being, one in which the challenge becomes the advantage and the opportunity in ways that we can never know beforehand. And I'm going to close with what a six-year-old friend said. His name's Gibran, uh, and he's the son of a very dear friend of mine, Mimi. And uh, he, he asked his mom recently, do you, do you know what the secret of life is? And uh, Mimi said, well, um, why don't you tell me what it is? And so he thought, and he says, well, uh, it's people who change people. And I, I think Gibran's onto something. Those are words to live by. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Michelle. <clears throat> Thank you, Zeba. Um, I think if we could all just take a few seconds and let ourselves sit with what we heard before we go into some questions and just see what gets discovered inside yourself. So let's just do that for a moment because what we heard were some really powerful and very, at times, painful information. Thank you. Um, first, I want to again thank you for your presentations. They were very moving uh, and at the same time very hopeful. There was a lot of, as you mentioned, Michelle, resilience in the women and your grantees are doing remarkable work. And I think although there is a lot of traumatization occurring right now, there's also a lot of collaboration among people that perhaps would not have collaborated as strongly as they would have had this not been happening. And it may be that at the end of the day, we will be a better country for it. It just may be. Um, do people want to come to the mic and, and ask any questions from uh, these two wonderful individuals or myself about our immigrant work? And if you do come, it would be really nice for me to know and perhaps for our parents to know if you identify yourself as an immigrant, uh, because I, I think that means a lot for us to hear that in this particular room in this session. So would anyone like to come to the mic and ask a question? Please. Hi, my name is Rita Valent Quinn. I am an immigrant from Portugal, and I work with immigrants. So there isn't any other place that I'd rather be today. Thank you so much for the powerful presentations. Michelle, I have a question for you. Um, my theater company, as I said, works a lot with immigrants, and I know that we cannot do the work that we do without very strong collaborations in, in the community. And I heard you say we a lot during your presentation, and I was wondering if you could sp speak a little bit about those collaborations, how they were established, how they evolved through, through the project. Thank you. Oh, I had shut it off. <laughs> um, sure, and, and I, I forgot to mention, so I, I am not an immigrant artist. I'm a child of immigrants. Uh, my mother's from Colombia, my father's from Puerto Rico, and I grew up and still live in a predominantly immigrant family market um, in South Philadelphia. Um, so that was my um, connection, and... Um, I'm also a mother, and uh, I'm also a child of two people that have experienced extreme poverty and violence. Um, so all of those things I also bring forth within my experience. 
Um, I also acknowledge, as I mentioned, my privilege of coming in and out of spaces. So I'm really conscious about my artistic practice and how individuals are involved in that practice. Um, and, um, and so I keep that very present in my work. Um, so in terms of um, uh, how I am engaging the community, so I'm just gonna speak to the two examples, two examples that I had shown. So one example for exa uh, is the uh, We Are Human Beings, the piece that we actually placed in front of the uh, ICE building. So I work closely with Juntos, which is an immigrant rights organization um, based in South Philadelphia, but has been fighting for immigrant rights um, for over 10 years now. Um, my first approach was actually going to them and saying, hey, I have this idea. I would like to have your youth involved. I wanna see if families are involved. I would like to see if there might be some families who might be interested in participating. Um, I was able to connect with some families and then through other members of those families, I was able to connect with others. Um, in the case of the words of Anna, um, four out of those five interviews, I had conducted one-on-one -on -one with the families. Um, the interview uh, that those words were coming from um, was actually conducted by uh, Juntos. And so I was able to hear the excerpts and then I was able to, um, with the permission of Anna, who was then now fighting her deportation case in Chicago. So it's hard, again, it's like all of these things happen, like when we're thinking about the deportation system and the detention system, it's um, the lack of access of going in. It's not the same of saying, come to my workshop and come, let's work together for these series of sessions. It's not the same. And decisions are made so quickly, so a person can be in one place and then all of a sudden they're somewhere else. Um, so through her lawyer, uh, through Anna's lawyer, and I was able to get permission to use those, she was fine with us using those words and installing them. Uh, I used the, um, I was able to have access through Juntos in their uh, office spaces to then open a weekend where uh, individuals from the community, allies, could actually come and help create the stencil with me. And then we organized, we, me and Juntos, organized a number of folks that can come and help install. Now this is really crucial to the process, right? Because if I wanted undocumented families to come and stand in front of ICE, I needed to make sure that they were secure and safe, right? The risk that I take as a citizen is very little, I could get a fine, compared to someone who is undocumented or their children that can be detained or deported. So I basically harassed our outgoing mayor, Mayor Michael Nutter, and uh, I also uh, connected with the streets commissioner because in the city of Philadelphia, um, uh, if I were to put something on the sidewalk, I would have to talk to the building owner, which would have been ICE. But if I did something in the street, I would get the permission from the city. And so um, I had kind of like a powerhouse of folks um, Juntos with their connections in the city because of the activism and organizing that they've done. Uh, the Mural Arts Program, because that was part of the citywide project called Open Source. Um, and so Jane Golden, who's the director of the Mural Arts Program, has a lot of connections within the city. And that's how we were able to connect. And at that time, I also happened to be doing a mural in honor of the, one of the mayor's uh, friends who had passed away. She was an LGBTQ uh, activist and leader, Gloria Casares. So I was able to have access to him that I wouldn't be able to in any other place. So all of these kind of energies combined, <laughs> uh, we were able to really make that happen. That install happened on Monday, October 15th. I got the okay and the permission, a written permission to do this on that Friday. Mind you, the stencil was already made, the supplies were already bought because I was taking, I wasn't gonna take no for an answer. <laughs> and it happened, right? Um, but I say all of this because if I'm going, I need to be responsible and it's not just about my own artistic vision and what I want, right? It's also about making sure that each one of those family members were safe and secure in that space. And it was such a magical moment because after we had installed, we had chanted all together because we know that there are loved ones in that center, in, in that building that are being detained. And we also knew that those ICE agents were watching us at every moment. Um, 
So we had the police blocking us on one end and everybody thought something was going on in social media. Oh no, the police are there. They're no, they're blocking the street so that we can uh, do this strategically on Columbus Day. <laughs> Um, so that's just one, one example. I think I explained too much, but um, with the mothers right now, and I'll, I'll make this really super short, with the mothers right now, it's the challenge is my short amount of time in visiting them. Um, I'm constantly commuting, communicating with them. They are my biggest resource. Uh, the coalition has been really great in connecting me with uh, a lot of other activists within the state of Pennsylvania which is where I'm building my work because I'm trying to create these public art installations that are then activated by the local organizers um, and that they have the freedom to decide what that activation will be. Um, but uh, the mothers are the ones that have been able to connect with the other mothers. Not all of them know me. And so that sense of trust uh, that they have, and they're through WhatsApp, they're still communicating with the mothers that are in Central America. Those are the ways that I'm building those relationships. And in the end, basically, um, all of these videos that I'm currently editing, they will see, they will be the first ones to see it. They will be the first ones to decide what they feel comfortable in sharing. And so that, it takes a lot longer, and it's a lot more of time invested but I don't see myself doing it in any other way because they're the ones that need to have the power of how their stories are going to be told. Thank you. Would anyone else like to come? Please. And if you are doing something in support of immigrant artists, we'd like to hear that as well, very much. Hello. Thank you so much for your conversation. Uh, my name's Carl, I'm not an immigrant, I'm an American citizen, but I grew up outside of America, and so I still feel like an outsider even though I walk through this country with a lot of privilege. My question is, in our work around advocacy and working with artists, uh, we want to get them paid not just in accolades and gratitude, but also in cash. And to the conversation, yeah, right? Um, to that conversation of supporting undocumented mothers, uh, working with undocumented artists or partners, uh, what supports around that kind of both payment but then other protections uh, have you encountered, have you worked with? Can you share with us, please? I can share briefly. And we met last time, right? Yes. Springboard, right? Yes. Hi. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, uh, so uh, I, as I mentioned before, I, uh, the second phase is um, uh, supported through the uh, Robert Rauschenberg Foundation Artists as Activist Fellowship. Um, I didn't get the full amount, <laughs> which is why I was still fundraising, so um, I've been looking for other smaller grants to support, for example, the small book, which is the fanzine, um, and to uh, kind of piece together this, the videos and the documentary. So through the, the it's, it's really refreshing to go into these different spaces in Pennsylvania and talk to these groups, and the first thing I say is, I'm not asking for money because I have the funding to be able to support this. And so everybody kind of like, oh, okay. <laughs> but I was like, but if you have the money, yes, I, I, would, I will put it to use. Um, uh, regarding the mothers, um, they uh, have all received a small, the three mothers that I've interviewed, a small stipend. Um, not, incre not a whole lot of money, but for the time that they are dedicating uh, and connecting with me. Um, the other thing that I want to say is that, uh, and I was sharing this with another colleague yesterday, is like sometimes I feel that the art, insta like the art installations obviously and, and the projects, they, they have a purpose and a meaning and a voice, but then there are other things like a really direct need. So while the mothers were detained in um, the detention center, I was able to make a list and an Amazon list, because people want to say, people come to me, they're like, what else can we do? And so I was like, well, call your representatives. You need to lobby. You need to let people know what's going on. Sign this petition. Um, but instead of just doing just like a money donation, I created, I know Amazon has its complications. We created an Amazon list where people were then able to select certain items that they would be able to purchase that would be given as donations to the families that were, had to be new things. Like some of the families had the same underwear for the past two years that they were detained there. Their children were growing, so they needed new clothes that, were, that the center was not providing for them. 
So um, that, was a, that was one direct way that I was able to mobilize people that were interested in my project, but then also move them into the direction of doing a direct need. The second thing that I think was, that I'm really proud of is that um, during my conversations with the mothers that were released, I found out that each mother needed to pay. Mind you, they were cleaning the bathrooms, cooking, in the very same center that was detaining them for $1 a day. So when they were released, they were expected to pay $820 for a worker's permit to have permission to work in the United States to support their children. So some of them were still struggling because they couldn't provide for their families and they had to borrow money to be able to process this worker application fee. I brought it to the attention to the Shutdown Burks Coalition. They then also spoke with the lawyers that were representing the mothers. We were able to create a link and we were able to raise close to $4,200 um, to support the mothers and that money went directly to the moms for their worker, workers' permit fees and, and to support that, that fee so they can get to working and supporting their families. That is another direct need that came out of this conversation with the mothers, but I was also able to rely on the attention that I was getting around the flowers, around uh, the installation, and be able to um, direct people into that space for them to make a direct donation. So those are the things that I'm constantly figuring and creative, like thinking of like how else can I support the mothers? How else can we continue to support the families that are inside? Um, I'm trying to strategize to find ways to support those 10 mothers that were deported back um, to Central America and really um, thinking of a creative strategy so that they, in the end, they need the money. You know, it's not about just clothes or, um, you know, they, they need the money to be able to survive. Um, and so if we can help in that way, that's what I'm trying to do at the moment. It's great to see you in the room. Uh, Springboard for the Arts became a 2018 Building Bridges grantee. Thank you for all the great work you do. We're delighted to, to have you in our, um, our family and also to see the work that you're going to do with the Somali uh, refugee community and the Cedar Riverside community. Uh, it's the largest, and I want to talk about that community for a moment. Um, it's the largest um, Somali refugee community in the US and uh, it, it resides in Cedar Riverside, which is also known as Little Mogadishu, correct me if I'm, I'm misspeaking. <laughs> um, and the Building Bridges Program actually has several grantees in that, um, in that particular community, including the Cedar Cultural Center. Um, and uh, we had a filmmaker who actually made a film, and I want to talk specifically to your question about um, artists uh, from, vulnerable communities being supported financially, um, which is very important because, um, as we all know, when you're feeling vulnerable, um, if someone extends a hand to you um, and, and gives you respect and um, allows you your dignity, it goes a long way, very, very long way. And part of that is also recognizing your talents and supporting you financially. And this is something that we hope you'll do with, with your grant as you, as you implement it. Um, but in that um, little Mogadishu community, we had a filmmaker named Musa Saeed, who's um, from the South Asian Muslim community. And he um, was part of another building, a Building Bridges grant that was focused on giving skills training, video skills training to Muslim youth around the, uh, the US. And he um, arrived in Little Mogadishu to work with uh, Somali youth. And in his work for, it was for the Center for Asian American Media, which is in um, the Bay Area, in uh, San Francisco Bay Area. and. Uh, in the process of these workshops that he was doing with these young people, he um, had an idea for a feature film, a fiction uh, film, based on 
um, some of the youth, um, inspired by them, and he developed a feature film and then approached us for development funding for this film. Uh, he's a Sundance uh, Film Festival award winner, and both a documentarian and, and in um, narrative filmmaking. And he decided to use um, the community as actors, and of course to pay them. Um, and that's what he did. He developed a story called Astray, which is about um, a, a teenager, a Somali teenager, um, who is driving a cab and he has sort of, he's sort of a lost uh, young man and uh, he's driving a cab. One day he hit a dog um, and got out of his cab and decided that he had to help her somehow and the only way he thought to do that was to carry her around in his cab and one of the things is that in Islam the literalists really believe that dogs are quote unquote unclean. And so by carrying the dog in his ca cab, he was in some ways uh, violating his belief system, but he was also pulled by that very uh, humane instinct to support a life that he had somehow damaged. Um, she heals. And the other complication in the story is that he um, was sleeping in the local mosque. The imam in the mosque had given him space to sleep because his mom had kicked him out and he had no home. He smuggled the dog into the mosque <laughs> and he kept her hidden. Uh, and then he was discovered and all hell broke loose. So uh, the <laughs> question, the central question was, what is he gonna do now? Is he gonna give up the dog, or is he going to leave the mosque, or is he going to somehow change the mosque culture? I mean, this is left hanging in the, in the, in the balance in the film. Um, and it, um, the, the point that he raised in the film, uh, the, the very fundamental questions about uh, humaneness and our, our um, f basic instincts, and then um, the social norms of the, um, the belief systems that overlay that and that, that tension between the two. But in his, the way in which he approached the project on the project level, um, he was very respectful and um, to the community and it took some doing to draw them out and actually get them to, to um, participate in the project. And um, it was a complicated process, but it was about winning trust and giving respect. So building that trust and then um, making sure that they were respected uh, throughout the process was something that he found, um, you know, really expanded him um, on a very personal and also on a professional level. So that's one thing. The other thing I'm going to jump to another perspective, which is um, the portfolio level perspective of the Building Bridges program, to say that um, uh, a few years ago, uh, I was uh, sitting in on a reviewer's, external reviewer's um, meeting in which they were discussing our applicants. It was for one of our grants competitions. And one application in particular um, was discussed for its uh, merits in terms of the concept and also its implementation chops, but it was flagged for the fact that uh, in the budget, it had a very low um, amount of money for artists. And in fact, that got turned down for that reason. So um, from, from the program perspective, we're very conscious of this, uh, of being equitable um, on every level and correcting ourselves uh, when we find that we, our reviewers uh, or our grantees are not on course. I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, two things came to mind. One, uh, Michelle, when you were talking about the exorbitant amount of money that these women have to pay to get their work permit, uh, it occurred to me that my son, who's 16, uh, needs a work permit, and all we had to do was show his birth certificate and he is able to receive one at no cost. And so it, it steeps me in this whole systemic oppressive society that we live in that has put into place these systems that 
really are so disadvantaged to people just trying to do the best they can. Uh, and that one really shocked me and, and <clears throat> it made me keenly aware of the privileges I have as a citizen in this country. Um, and what you said, Zeba, also struck me because at, uh, at NIFA we've had an immigrant artist program for 12 years and we, until the, administra the new administration came in, uh, we always hit the ground running uh, with talking about their artistic discipline and uh, ways for them to capitalize on their work and to network with individuals. And today the whole thing has changed. It's all about trust. We spend a lot of time today, uh, and we work in different cities, gaining their trust before uh, we can talk to them about their work. And that had never been the case before. And so clearly this trembling fear that they're all walking around with now uh, and thinking that perhaps we will portray them in some way. Uh, we will give away information or we will identify them in some way uh, is, is deeply prevalent and I don't know, I just, uh, sometimes it leaves me speechless what we've done uh, in, in, in the last uh, 12 months or so to the people that live here. More questions from the floor, please. There's time for both. <laughs> Hello there. Um, so I'm not a very good public speaker, so I wrote it down. Um, bear with me. My name is Janelle Coronado, and I'm from um, the San Francisco East Bay area. Um, I want to, I'm not a, uh, an immigrant, but I am the granddaughter of an immigrant. Um, my grandmother came from San Juan de los Lagos in Mexico, and my grandfather used to go to, um, he was from uh, Texas, and he used to go to the parties, and that's where they met. Um, I want to reiterate my shared gratitude um, that I think we all share for your very powerful presentation. Um, it's very hard and difficult for me to hear, you know, these things, but they are certainly bright spots in the story that you have shared. Um, and I wanted to share something really small, and I also have a question. Um, I wanted to share that I had the absolute privilege um, a couple weeks ago to see Dolores Huerta, the co-founder of the National Farm Workers Association, receive a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Green Lining Institute, and that was fantastic. I shared it with my dad, it brought him to tears. And um, she had a call to action for steadfast support for immigrants and refugees. Um, so I'm hoping to ask you all uh, to speak about the absolute importance um, in mobilizing with these vulnerable communities and not just for. Um, so with the work that I've been doing with the second phase of Familia, <coughs> Familia Separadas, um, I reached out to Jasmine Rivera, who is part of the Shutdown Brooks Coalition. Um, she actually used to work at Juntos and uh, spearheaded the uh, Shutdown Brooks campaign. Um, when I came to her, um, again, we were at this moment where we weren't sure what was going to happen with the 14 mothers. Um, I think it was during the month of between April and May when it was decided that those 10 mothers were going to be deported. And so the, I would say the light that shined was just a lot dimmer with all of the people who were mobilizing and fighting for the mothers. So I came at a, at a time where that light was still there, but very low. Um, and I had this whole intention of working directly with the 14 moms and then all of that kind of changed. Um, I feel that I, because of that reason and coming into that space, um, specifically the two mothers that I've worked with, um, their, their feeling was also very low too. Their light was very low. And so I was able to offer something that was different, right? They were up to here with like campaign letters. They were tired of having to retell their story again and again and again in their cases. Um, so I really just started with 
tell me, tell me what your life was like before coming here. Tell me, uh, I asked them, um, where was a moment that you felt the most free? Um, how do you define freedom? Um, beginning to really talk about these questions that um, they weren't continuous, you know, they, they weren't really asked, right? Um, and I came at a time where, again, those paper flowers seemed so simple, but it helped, and one of the mothers, because I felt like, I, am I doing enough? And one of the mothers had said, it helped me keep my mind off of what will happen tomorrow. And so just those little moments that I feel that um, are, are moments of healing for the mothers is extremely important. As I'm moving forward, um, as I'm uh, trying to get more funding and, and uh, thinking of these strategies to continue to help the mothers, um, it's really about finding ways to, to support them and, and this is just me, Michelle. This isn't like written into my grant or like the foundation. The whole like uh, helping fundraise those, you know, bring it to the attention of the coalition and them sparking that action to, to do, um, to raise funds. That wasn't part of my grant. It was just, look, there's a need and I need, how else am I going to help the mothers, right? Um, but the other part of this is like, um, with the mothers specifically, it's also, they're all independent intelligent women. They know how to make those the decisions that they need to make. Um, that small stipend that I'm giving them is something that they will decide how they are going to utilize that money. Um, but also, uh, while I was visiting the mothers, um, because the, uh, the lawyers are overextended with the cases, they really don't have a plan, a complete plan in action and, or, or, or offering all the resources that the mothers need now that they're released. So during my visits in each one of their respective cities, I then made, you know, I, I have the privilege to go onto internet, to look for resources, to find out where's a welcoming center, where can they find English classes. Um, now that they have their workers permit and a social security number, where they can actually find job placement within each one of their respective cities. So one of the mothers who was very afraid to go to their nearby, nearby library, I said, okay, let's conduct the rest of our interview here, and I'm gonna, we're gonna set up a meeting with one of the representatives from the Welcoming Center, and she is bilingual, I'm gonna introduce you, and she's gonna tell you what are the resources that we can have. But it took me to physically go there, because I'd share this information with her through Facebook and WhatsApp. And, but it took me to go there with her to feel secure, to then go to the library, to then have access to these resources, even down to healthcare. Um, the, the young child that you see there, all of his front teeth were removed because they didn't, get, they didn't take him, he had an infection, they didn't take him to a dentist. Um, he's, you know, he's not even, he just turned five. Um, and so there's, so he needs, continuous like also health care and for herself and therapy and so all of these things are such a great need that there's no infrastructure set up to support these mothers that have now been released and so I can only do what I can within the space that I'm that I'm in so beyond money right it's it's also being bilingual it's having access to information it's not being afraid, being, for me, it's easy for me to go into spaces that are unknown, that are very different than for the families that have been detained. So it's basically trying to go through that process and helping them directly in that way. Great, so it, it is almost time to end, but I wanna give you, sir, the opportunity to ask your question. So please come up to the mic, just keep that in mind. And I believe that both Michelle and Zeba can stay a few minutes after to answer more questions, uh, please. sharing and thank you to the room for being here um, my name is Jason Chong and I'm with the California Arts Council I identify as a child of immigrant families I'm fifth generation on my father's side and third on my mother's so going back to your own country meant my hometown of Sacramento when I was growing up um, I have a question I guess for the room and for you both what can we do to encourage that this discussion is central 
to the next apt as opposed to on the periphery? What can we do to make sure that supports to immigrant, refugee, and vulnerable communities is something at the center of the discussion? Um, so that's just my first thought and question to you. My second is that, so with the Arts Council, I am the project manager for, for a program titled Cultural Pathways. It's for people of color, immigrant, refugee, tribal, and indigenous groups. And if there are any other folks that have funding programs for these specific populations, I'd love for you, know, you all to come and connect with me so that I can learn with you how to do things better. And so that leads to my second question to you both. We provide general operating support for two years. We just announced our second cycle, 400,056 grantees for a two-year period. And the strategy is, is funding plus support, so professional development, workshops across the state, access to information, resources, and webinars. My question is, what more can be done? What more can we do structurally? And if you have specific ideas, I'd love to hear. Thank you. Thank you for those really thoughtful questions. Um, to your first question about what more can we do to keep uh, this issue uh, front and center on the table, tables and in the rooms uh, and in conversation, I think having that awareness and making sure that we raise those issues up uh, in our personal and our professional capacity is, is really, really important. Um, it's something that I try to do um, in both ways. Um, and uh, I think the, somebody mentioned the bright spots earlier. Uh, I think the bright spot in this muck that we're living today is that um, there's that other instinct, that other impulse that is um, springing forward from uh, so many of us which is to, um, to collaborate, to support, to encourage. Um, and uh, on the other side of it are the spoilers uh, who pathologize us, um, those of us who are immigrants, or actually just about everybody. Um, and so, th so there's, that's one thought. And to really live our values in that way, it's something that uh, I, especially just uh, after Ram Ramadan, this month of reflection, have really reflected on that I need to up my game and really live my values even more. So that's one part. And to your second question about um, structurally, those of us who are in institutions and our funders, what can we do? And those of us who are in um, cultural settings as uh, cultural workers and, and organizers, what can we do to support, to provide further support structurally? Um, I can say that, that uh, one need that we identified at the Building Bridges Program is that um, most often, uh, uh, artists and also organizations that are doing projects have uh, all their focus and, and their budget on just getting the project off the ground. And there's very little left for anything else. There is a wee bit left for marketing, uh, but there is uh, virtually nothing left for communications, strategic communications, and messaging is key. So we provide our grantees through a consultant that we engage on the program level, um, the services of uh, a one-on-one -on -one strategic communication support for the, the uh, period of the grant. So some of our grantees have a one-year grant, some of them have two or three years. And um, this consultancy, these consultants are with them alongside from the very beginning. When I go back to New York um, in a week or so, we're doing our uh, first um, strategic communications boot camp for our uh, 2018 grantees and Springboard for the Arts is going to be there. See you there. <laughs> it's two days full on um, total immersion uh, with the strategic communications company and they, uh, they, re they really set the pace for it. We also invite in alumni who share back their experience of uh, their strategic communications training, um, and we encourage our grantees to uh, pay it forward uh, into their organizations and to into their communities. 
So that's been something that we've identified as a need and, and uh, support in uh, beyond just grant dollars to grantees. I'm going to officially end it. However, uh, our panelists are still here for you to come and ask questions. But in officially ending it, please help me in thanking our panelists for being here today. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you, Michael, for moderating such a good conversation. Thanks for the team to help set up with the presentations, too.